was within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. seek God's blessing over our worship with him. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we are here to magnify your name, to exalt your name together, to sing your glory to the nations and your praise among the populations of the world. 
We are here to sing of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, which outdistances our gaze. We are here in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Gather together as your people and gather together as those who have been called out of darkness into your marvelous light. Called to proclaim your excellences in our songs, in our prayers, in our words, in our actions. Father, we are here also to be equipped by your spirit to do that. Not just today in this place, where in a sense it's easy to worship you as we focus our energy and attention on you and hear your word proclaimed, but also tomorrow when we return to our work. We return to the regular routines that we have when we become busy again with our daily lives. We pray that you would equip us this day to worship you tomorrow and the next day and beyond. Father, we thank you that you speak to us, that we could sing of your truth which is planted deep in us, the truth of your word that is above all revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that as we open your word again this morning, as we meditate in particular about what we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord and complete Savior, we pray that you would plant your truth into our hearts. We pray that you would reassure us of the gospel, that you would convict us of our sins, so that we seek our salvation more eagerly outside of ourselves in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we know that you have promised in your word that those who pray for the grace that we need and for your Holy Spirit will indeed receive it, and that you will no more refuse us these things than our earthly fathers would refuse us earthly things. So we come to you confidently, seeking your blessing over our worship of you, seeking to be filled with all the goodness that you provide. We lay these things before your throne of grace in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now read from Scripture. We'll begin with reading from Luke chapter 3. And we'll read verse 1 through 22. Luke chapter 3, verse 1 through 22, and after the reading of God's word, we will sing hymn 15. There we read God's word. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria, and Trachonitis and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood reign of, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abram as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, 
But he who, he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So far.
The text for the sermon this morning is Luke chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, which we, have, <clears throat> which we have already read. After the proclamation of God's word, we will sing in response of Psalm 56, stanzas 4 and 5. Beloved in Christ, I grew up just north of Toronto, but I didn't spend much time downtown until my university days. I recall vividly one of my first trips into the city, coming off the subway and seeing a street preacher. He had a long beard and ragged clothing. He was standing on a little, on a little platform, <clears throat> and he had a sign hanging from his shoulders, <coughs> excuse me, a sign hanging from his shoulders that said, judgment is coming. He didn't have a lot to say. He just kept repeating at the top of his lungs, you are going to hell. Repent from your sins. I can still hear him. Whenever I read the accounts of John the Baptist in the Gospels, I have to think of that street preacher because in some ways, John was like him. He stood out like a sore thumb. Matthew tells us <clears throat> in his Gospel that he wore clothing made of camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. And his message was not much different than a street preacher. <clears throat> he calls the crowds a brood of vipers. He speaks of the coming wrath, and he keeps talking to them about sin and about repentance. That's what our passage this morning is all about, repentance from sin. John is busy preparing the way for Jesus. That's his mission. And his message is simple, repent. How do you get ready for Jesus? Repent. This past week, we had a conference for the seminary students and local pastors and others interested in evangelism at church planting. Your pastor was there too. Something one of the speakers said caught my attention. He said, I wonder if we talk much about repentance these days, and I wonder if we call people to repent these days. That caught my attention, in part because I was planning this sermon series on John the Baptist and in part because I think he's right. Do we think much or speak much about repentance? Well, John has much to say to us about repentance, and it lies at the heart of who he is as forerunner to Jesus, as the one who was preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. Our theme for this sermon is repentance, paving the way for Jesus. Luke begins our passage this morning with a lengthy setting of the historical stage. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eturia, and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. We've seen that sort of thing before when he starts his well-known Christmas narrative, in those days the decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Maybe you're wondering why all that's necessary. Is it a little over the, it's a little over the top, isn't it? Well, you need to remember what we discovered in the prologue to Luke's gospel, the opening verses quite some time ago. Do you remember the kind of account Luke said he'd give us? An orderly account, he said. Well, here's proof that he did what he set out to do. And don't forget why he wanted to give us such an account, because he wants us to have certainty. Here he does that by placing John's ministry and the beginning of Jesus' ministry right in the middle of verified and verifiable history. He wants us to know that what he's, that what he's about to tell us really, truly happened in time. So what can we have certainty about? Luke moves on to his main point. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. The word of God came. That's a significant statement, one we might miss if we don't stop and listen to what God is saying here through Luke. You see, in some respects, God had been silent for centuries, for 400 years, in fact. Since the prophet Malachi, who wrote the last book of the Old Testament, there had been no biblical prophets. 
At home, we have this great board book for our one and a half year old Zion. It's called The Biggest Story ABC, and it's written by Kevin DeYoung. Maybe you know about it. It's worth buying for your kids, your grandkids, your nephews, nieces, your neighbor's kids. You get the picture. My favorite part of the book comes at the letters Q and R. Until finally, God seemed to be quiet for hundreds of years. That's the Q, and it's absolutely right. Things are quiet between the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We might misunderstand that quiet. Some of God's people at the time did. They thought he had abandoned his people. But it wasn't the quiet of God ignoring his people, of God turning his face away. It was the quiet of expectation, of anticipation, the hush that falls over everything when something's about to happen. Listen to the R. But God hadn't left. He was just getting things ready. That's exactly it. God was getting things ready. He was preparing the scene. The people of God who were still waiting with anticipation, people like Simeon and Anna, they knew that God was still busy, that God was still preparing the salvation he had promised. And they also knew one more thing had to happen to make things ready for the Messiah. The very last thing God had said through Malachi, almost the very last words of the Old Testament, was this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Well, the day was at hand. Elijah had come. Earlier in the gospel, Luke told us about the promise the angel Gabriel made to Zechariah about John. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. God's promises have come true. God has sent his second Elijah as he had promised. That's what's happening here in our text. And the word of God came to John. This isn't a throwaway line. This is the glorious mercy, the grace and covenant faithfulness and steadfast love of our God. John is the second Elijah God had promised. 400 years ago, 400 years of silence, but then the word of God came to John. God is faithful to his promises. God is true to his word. He flowers each promise of his word as we sang together at the opening of scripture. That becomes even clearer yet when Luke quotes from an even more ancient prophet, Isaiah, who prophesied more than 700 years before John the Baptist. He already prophesied that the word of God would come to someone in the wilderness. We read that together earlier. Luke says, that was about John. That was about this man. 700 years, God does not forget. God is not a man that he should lie, nor does he change his mind. He is true to his word. All of his promises are firm and true. From where do we receive our certainty of faith? How can you be sure of what you hear, of what you see in God's word, of what you witness in the sacraments? You can be sure because the character and nature of your God, because of who he is. Our certainty, our assurance, I've said before, is not in ourselves, it's in him. We receive greater certainty when we know God better. We receive greater certainty when we know his promises better. Do you know his promises? They're all over the place in his word. Every promise in the book is mine, Every chapter, every verse, every line goes the old hymn. It's true for those who belong to Jesus Christ, and every promise is guaranteed by the God who made them. Trust him to be true in his word, even when you can't see it, especially when you can't see it, even when you have to wait, even when God seems silent. Every promise in the book is mine. 700 years have passed since the prophet Isaiah made his prophecy that comfort was on his way, that God would restore his people. 700 years that the promise comes true, John the Baptist appears on the scene. So what's his purpose? He's busy preparing the way. That's what Gabriel had said to Zechariah before his son John was born, that he was coming to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. 
That's what Zechariah had said. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. That's what Isaiah had prophesied. Prepare the way of the Lord. John has one purpose, to get the people ready for the coming of the Messiah, to make sure the people are prepared for the entrance of Jesus on the scene. He's the herald, the forerunner. Back in the day, when a king would come to visit a city, a lot of effort was expended to make sure that everything was ready for his coming. The herald would be sent to the city in advance to make sure that it was all ready and to proclaim the coming of the king. Sometimes that would involve serious construction projects. The king had to make a triumphal entry into the city, usually in his fanciest chariot, and so the gates needed to be wide enough. The road leading up to the city needed to be smooth enough. The ramp leading up to the gates needed to be perfect, and the way needed to be cleared for the grand entrance. If you go to the old city of Jerusalem today, you can drive in with your car beside Jaffa Gate. There is a big breach in a wall there, and the road is like a ramp leading you up into the city. It dates back to 1898 when the German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II visited Jerusalem. He wanted to make a triumphal entry into the city, and so he had them break the wall down and prepare the way up to the city. That's the picture Isaiah's prophecy gives us. John's purpose is to pave the way for the coming of the great king, who is none other than God himself. His purpose is to fill in the valleys, to level the mountains and hills, to make the crooked straight, and to make the rough places level. John is there to create a superhighway through the wilderness so that the coming king can travel down it. Why? So that he can enter into the city of Jerusalem? No. So that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now remember what the name Jesus means, God saves. Remember what Simeon sang when he saw Jesus in his arms. My eyes have seen your salvation. Now all flesh will see the salvation of God. John's purpose is to prepare the people to see King Jesus to see the one who is the God who saves. That raises the question, how would they be prepared? To answer that, we need to look at Luke's summary of the message of John's sermons. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what his, that was his, thermo, his sermon's theme, if you will. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let's start with the baptism itself. John calls the people to be baptized in the Jordan River. He calls them to come down into the river with him to be dunked under. That was an extraordinary message. You have to remember that these are the days before Christ instituted the sacrament of baptism. This isn't the same as our baptism into the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Baptism wasn't all that common at the time. The Jews were used to ritual cleansing and ritual bathing. If you go there today, you can see ritual baths called mikvot at almost every archaeology site, archaeological site. But that baptism, if it even happened then, was reserved only for non-Jews who wanted to become part of the Jewish people. But John was telling everyone that they needed to come into the waters of the Jordan River to be baptized by him. The question is, why? What did John's baptism signify and seal to the people? Well, Luke makes it very clear. It was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Those two things in that order. When the people came to John and were dipped into the waters of the Jordan River, it was a sign to them that because of their repentance, they received the forgiveness of sins. This wasn't about the external ritual itself. It wasn't just about the baptism. It was all about the hearts of the people. John was busy paving the way for the coming of Jesus, and that meant more than anything that the hearts of the people needed to be prepared. Their hearts were the wilderness that needed to be prepared. Their hearts were the mountains and the valleys, the crooked and rough places that needed to become level and straight. How? 
through repentance. In order for the people to be ready for the coming of Jesus, in order for them to see the salvation of their God, they needed to turn away from their sins. That's what repentance is, a holy hatred of sin, a turning away from sin, and a turning towards God. Fleeing from sin and pursuing God. That is, fleeing the things that God hates and running towards God himself. John preached repentance because only those who repent from their sins are ready for Jesus, ready for the one who saves. If you think again of that picture of the king entering the city on the superhighway, we can say, as one commentator does, repentance is the on-ramp to salvation. John's baptism was the sign and seal of the forgiveness of sins. It was a sign and seal that they were washed clean of their sins. But we can't ignore what was necessary first, repentance. That makes sense. You don't get washed unless you know you're dirty. We can go so far as to say there is no forgiveness without repentance. That's not to say that the act of repentance has the power to take away our sins. Only the blood of Jesus has the power to bring us forgiveness. But if we don't repent of our sins, we won't be forgiven. Because only people who know they're sinners, who hate, who hate their sins, will ever come to Jesus for the salvation that they need. Have you ever wondered why it was the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the people Luke likes to simply call sinners who would come to Jesus? Because they were the ones who knew they needed saving. Because they knew their sins. Because they knew they needed forgiveness. Because they had no excuses for their sins. They had no defense for their wickedness. And when they saw Jesus, they could see the salvation of their God. They could see he was the God who saves. We can ask the corresponding question, why didn't the Pharisees or the scribes or the teachers of the law accept Jesus? Because they wouldn't repent. Because they wouldn't admit they were sinners. Because they would justify everything they did. Because they had explanations and reasons for everything. Because they didn't hate anything that they did. Is there anything in your life that you hate? It's not a comfortable question, is it? And yet it's one we should ask regularly and should ask personally. The profession of faith form, do you truly detest and humble yourself before God because of your sins? The Lord's Supper form, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. How aware are you of your sins? Do you hate your sins? Or do you often try to justify them or explain them away? How is your repentance? I ask that, and John preached that, not because we ought to wallow in our sins, not to develop some kind of complex about ourselves, but in order, following, following up on the profession of faith question, in order that we would seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. Repentance is the on-ramp to salvation. Repentance paves the way to Jesus. You're not going to come to Jesus with any sense of desperation unless you know how badly you are in need of saving. Unless you know how deeply the stain of sin goes, how messed up and broken you are. You'll only run to Jesus if you know how much you need him. If you stop justifying yourself and admit your need. How is your repentance? Have you taken the on-ramp to salvation? Have you run to Jesus? Perhaps you're here this morning and you have no knowledge of your sin. You don't really know your need, let, an, let alone hate anything you do or have done. The call to repent this morning is urgent. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to consider the judgment that John announces is coming. These are life and death questions, eternal life and eternal death. How do you come to a place of repentance and sorrow over your sins so that you run to Jesus on the highway he has prepared? Maybe a conversion story will help. Lacey Sturm was the lead singer of the band Flyleaf, 
and is now a solo artist. Before that, she was an atheist living in a homosexual relationship. At that time, she had no knowledge of her sin or wrong or her own depravity. She didn't know her need. Listen to how she describes what changed her. Compared to the people I hated, I thought I was at least much better than they were. But when you're standing in front of God saying, I'm good, it's like saying I'm tall when you're standing in front of a mountain. I'm big when you're standing in front of the ocean. Or I'm old while looking at the stars. The thought is absurd. I realized I had no idea what good was because up to that point, I had not stood in the presence of the God who made the universe. Repentance begins when you stand in the presence of the God of the universe. Repentance begins when you encounter his burning holiness. Repentance begins when you fall on your face before the God who called all things into being and realize your profound unholiness. Repentance looks like Peter when he realized that Jesus was the Son of God. He fell on his face and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. But the wonder of the gospel is that this isn't where the story stops. The message of John's baptism was repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was the message that pointed forward, that prepared the way. Jesus was coming, and he would secure the forgiveness of sins for everyone who comes to him. John's baptism was a baptism of hope and a promise. It pointed forward. It paved the way. He was the forerunner. But the message of baptism in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is even more glorious because it rests not on the foundation of what will happen, but what has happened. It rests on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If you recognize your need, if you see your brokenness, if you hate your sins, if you are desperate for the salvation you can never achieve on your own, and you turn to Christ, you receive the forgiveness of sins. You see the salvation of God in the face of Jesus. Then his blood washes you of every guilty stain. That's not just the message of baptism, but of our other sacrament too, the Lord's Supper. Some have misunderstood the celebration as a declaration that we have it all together, that we're doing okay. That couldn't be farther from the truth. We don't come to the table to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves, just the opposite. In fact, if you think you have it all together, you'd better not go to the table. If all you want to do is defend yourself, excuse your sins, justify yourself, you'd better not go to the table. Go if you have a broken and contrite heart. Go if you are hungry and thirsty. Go if you are tired of things that can't satisfy, tired of trying to justify yourself. Go and say, I'm a sinner through and through, and I hate it, but I believe in the forgiveness of sins through the cross of Christ. Then Christ welcomes you at his table and says, come and taste my grace. The same goes for our weekly worship. God welcomes you into the worship this morning, not because you have earned your place in that pew. He welcomes you because Christ has brought us peace with God. He welcomes you because Christ has opened the way to a loving relationship with the God of heaven and earth. The way is open. His name is Jesus. Amen.
Let us come before the Lord in thanksgiving prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, when we come into your presence, give us a sense of your holiness. We, when we encounter you in your word, reveal to us your majesty and glory. By the power of your spirit, convict us of our sin and our guilt so that we stop justifying ourselves or excusing ourselves and flee to the cross of Jesus instead. Work in us the grace of repentance so that we turn away from our sins and find forgiveness and life in your son, Jesus Christ. Give us a holy hatred of sin and a deep love for you. Thank you, Father, for showing us your salvation in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thank you for, for your magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The sermon this morning was prepared by Dr. William Den Hollander. We now have the opportunity to praise the Lord with our offerings. The offering this morning is for the mustard seed. And after they have been gathered, we will sing in closing from hymn 80, stanzas 1, 2, 5, and 6.
Receive now the blessing of the Lord and depart in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.